Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Kate Conger is a technology reporter for the New York Times based out of San Francisco, and she's covering privacy, policy, and labor. She's been closely following the ride hail sector and specifically Prop 22, so I'm really excited to chat with her today and probably uh, learn a lot uh, that, I, that I never knew. So Kate, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing well. You know, I actually always find it really fun to have folks like yourself on who I consider real reporters and who are really (laughs) out there doing real journalism, because even though like Prop 22, like I've been interviewed on many times and asked all these questions, but I know in this interview, I'm probably going to pick up a a few things that I didn't even even know. Well, I think it's interesting going the other direction, too, because I feel like every driver I talk to has a different take. And I know you're talking to a ton of drivers all the time. So it's interesting to sort of get that viewpoint on what all these companies are up to. Very cool. Well, you know, I've been following your reporting really closely during this whole Prop 22 battle. And uh, I guess you're also pretty extensively covering the ride hail sector, Uber and Lyft. And Mm -hmm. I I think I just want to start off with asking, obviously, we kind of know what the results of Prop 22 are now, but did the outcome actually surprise you? It didn't. I think just the amount of money that was being spent on this kind of seemed like it was going to tip the scale in Uber's favor. So right Mm -hmm. off the bat, it seemed like, okay, this is going to go in the direction that the companies want it to go. And then, you know, watching the camp, whoa, watching the campaign play out over the course of the summer, it just seemed like organized labor was a little bit split in their focus because they were also backing Prop 15. And Mm -hmm. so it didn't seem like there was the same kind of full attention, full court press going into the no campaign that there was going into the yes campaign. And of course, financially, they were very mismatched. Yeah. And I mean, I believe the no campaign did end up spending $20 million, which in any other race would have been a pretty large sum, right? Right. Yeah. I think they got up to 18 million or so. It's somewhere in that in that area. But yeah, I mean, it was a pretty decent sized chunk of money. But, you know, again, when you're up against 200 million, all the numbers yeah. start to seem kind of small. <laughs> yeah, and I think that was obviously the eye popping number observation fact that, you know, you know, didn't, didn't take a rocket scientist to realize like, wow, these companies are spending a lot of money, even if you have no basis for what a normal amount of money uh, is being spent on a proposition is. How much impact do you think that $200 million had? And sort of like if in your reporting, did you specifically see like how it was being spent or how it was being used um, there? Yeah, I mean, I think just anyone in California probably saw how some of it's being used. I mean, I got, I think, one mailer from the no campaign, and I got a stack Mm -hmm. from the yes side. So, you know, the spending there was really clear. Did you get a bunch of mail from them? So I'll be honest. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of people talk about, you know, the fact that they received all these mailers and texts and calls. And I definitely got all of those, but I didn't feel that they were like, I tried to like, think about it like unbiasedly, you know, like think about like, okay, I'm not like just going to be looking for these. I'm going to like think about it more holistically. And I mean, I, I don't even know if I got a noticeably amount greater, right? Like I'm not, you know, I'm flipping, flipping through my mail and I have like 10 different flyers in one single day, prop right. 15, prop 19, prop 22, supervisor this, supervisor that. And like, I'm sure that they spent a lot of money on stuff like that, but I I didn't notice like a tangible, like, wow, difference. And did you see anyone like actually like categorize like how much spending they put on that stuff relative to, you know, or like I didn't track it. I didn't go into the spending reports. You can look at this stuff on the secretary of state website and see what they spent on mailers versus what they spent on digital versus TV Mm -hmm. advertising. Um, all of that stuff and kind of break down what was spent where. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I mean, it might have been too that I was just getting a lot of the mail because I'm in the Bay Area. And yeah. I think, you know, obviously the Bay Area voted against the measure. Maybe they thought there was this was sort of like a swing county or mm. something. And so they were trying to do more push here to get people to flip over to the yes side. I don't know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think really the thing that was the most valuable for the yes campaign was being able to put all of those notices in, um, you know, in the app for the Mm -hmm. drivers, for the writers, that was really inescapable. And it's sort of, um, this, you know, way to get in touch with literally everyone who cares about the issue 
in a venue where the where the no campaign can't push back you know like if yeah. you put out a tweet and you say oh this is the things that this is going to do someone can come and respond back and say no it's not you're wrong or whatever and right. argue with you about <laughs> it and people see both sides but i think having all the messaging in the app without any counterpoint is really powerful yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And I mean, I think at first I sort of thought that, well, you know, I mean, Lyft just released their quarterly uh, numbers, I think you reported on, and I think they're still down close to four, in the 40 percentile range. Mm -hmm. You know, their rides are down year over year. And so I was sort of thinking to myself, well, you know, there aren't that many people riding right now. So they could almost kind of forget like how great Uber and Lyft are, you know, from a consumer point of view. Mm -hmm. And, and, but I think what ended up, I'm curious to get your take, like kind of what ended up happening though was the companies were still able to send out all these push notifications and emails, even though demand was sort of way down. I thought demand being down might kind of hurt them, but I don't know if it really did. What do you think? Yeah, I kind of wondered about that too. And I think the campaign did as well, right? Because if you mm -hmm. look back at the history of these companies, using the user base to lobby for them has always been a really effective way for them to push back on right. regulation. You know, they've gotten writers to show up to city council and, you know, advocate on their behalf. And that's been really powerful. And so having demand down, I think that was part of why the campaign shifted so heavily to focus on drivers and mm -hmm. to really try to, you know, focus on the driver message, recruit drivers to speak out on behalf of the measure. Um, you know, it's the same kind of tactic of trying to utilize the user base, but in, in a slightly different way. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think, you know, I think there was some worry that once the pandemic hit, that it would shift the narrative uh, against what Uber and Lyft were trying to do, both from the rider perspective of people just not being reliant on the services and from mm -hmm. a driver perspective, you know, all of a sudden, I think if you're driving for Uber and Lyft in normal circumstances, maybe you're young, health insurance isn't that important to you. You're like, whatever, I'm fine. I'm not going to get sick. But in a pandemic, all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I need health insurance. You know, I need yeah. that sick leave. Um, and, and so I think that was a little bit of a concern for them and back in March that they were thinking, oh, okay, this is going to really tip this against us. Got it. Yeah. And I mean, it seems like they, they were definitely getting a lot of heat for their sort of early sick pay policies, or mm -hmm. some people were kind of saying lack of sick pay policies, right. I guess you would say. And we covered a bunch of stories where drivers were having issues getting it actually paid out. And there are all these weird rules and requirements. But I feel like that has that story of drivers, you know, not being able to get health care or sick pay from Uber and Lyft and other companies has really kind of disappeared in the last several three to six months or so. Yeah, and I wonder if that's going to come back now, right? Because yeah. Prop 22 has said, okay, you're going to get this wage floor, you're going to get these certain health subsidies, you know, and I wonder if there's going to be that same sort of growing pains moment in the next couple of months where they start trying to implement this and drivers say, hey, wait a minute, you told me $21 an hour, I'm right. doing the math and I'm seeing 16, <laughs> I'm seeing 15, you know, or I thought I was going to get this for healthcare, I'm only getting that. So I think I think that that story is going to kind of come back around once they start trying to implement these benefits. Yeah. And I think just kind of sticking on this topic for one more second, I mean, just at large with the pandemic, I mean, the companies were essentially sort of bailed out with the pandemic unemployment assistance, right? I mean, all of these drivers wouldn't have normally qualified for, you know, basically unemployment insurance, right? Mm -hmm. And they kind of would have been really screwed. But in a way, it, I feel like it kind of worked in the company's favors because they hadn't been paying into unemployment insurance. The government and states kind of basically came along and paid all their drivers um, and the companies didn't have to pay any of that. And so it's sort of like, in one, on one way, it's kind of like, wow, the drivers, you know, if they would have been employees, they would have been getting all that and there wouldn't have been an issue. But it was like, we they kind of got the best of both worlds. Like they were independent contractors and then they still got all uh, some of the benefits of being on employees in this, when this pandemic hit. Uh, what, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, the unemployment issue was a big one. There was a lot of question right at the beginning, back in March and April, whether or not gig workers were going to be able to access unemployment insurance. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, I think at the state and the federal le level, there were changes made so that gig workers could get access. Um, right. But, you know, I think in California, for sure, the legislature is still looking at that. I think the, um, the attorney general is still looking at that, trying to figure out, okay, we gave out this money in an emergency, but we're going to try <laughs> to get Uber and Lyft to pay it back and, you know, try to get that money still, still somehow. So we'll see yeah. how that goes. Hmm. Um, you know, I think all that money that's in the unemployment fund comes from businesses mm -hmm. paying into it. Right. So right. 
I think from the state's perspective, you know, Uber and Lyft are kind of skimming off the backs of these small businesses yeah. and the state needs to figure out some way to rebalance that. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised to see the state try to go and recoup some of those funds. Yeah, no, it definitely seems like that would be the, the fair thing to do. And um, yeah, I mean, so what were some of the other main challenges that you saw the no on 22 campaign? What, what did they face? I mean, obviously the money you know, sort of being outspent 200 to close to 20 is the big one. Were there any other main challenges you think they faced? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the money is the really big one. Yeah, I think that, you know, there's also a lot, and I'm curious about your perspective on this too, actually. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of just really wildly differing claims about what would happen to drivers under yes and under no. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the companies were saying drivers are going to get $21 an hour. I also saw studies on the other side, I think as low as five sixty dollars years. an hour. Right. <laughs> and, and that's a huge gap, right? Like that's a huge yeah. gap. And so... I think there was just a lot of competing information and, and even spending as much time as I did on it, I was having a hard time sussing out, okay, what is actually going to happen here? Yeah. And I, I wonder, I mean, did you have a clear sense of, okay, you know, drivers are going to be better or worse off or what, what the results of the prop were actually going to be for drivers? Yeah, that's actually a good point. I think that was kind of a challenge that they faced that there was so much competing info. And I think you're actually spot on. Like I thought the narratives that Uber and Lyft were pushing were like, you know, way too extreme. You know, like every single, you know, it's basically they're making it seem like every single driver is going to, you know, have the worst job ever if this thing mm -hmm. passes. And on the on the no side, it was also like, you know, this is we're going to get to have our cake and eat it too. You know, we're all going to become employees. Everything's going to stay the same and it's all going to be great. And I think probably the answer was somewhere in the middle. To me, I think kind of the only thing that we really knew for sure is just that there would probably be less drivers. How many less drivers? I think it's hard to say just mm -hmm. because there's a fixed cost of hiring employees and someone like me who like occasionally goes out and drives for Uber and Lyft is like a terrible employee to have on <laughs> payroll and you would never want someone like me. So it's kind of obvious that I'd be cut first. And then also just the fact that you would lose some flexibility. Um, I think that's a given when you in align the incentives between the companies and the drivers during downtime time or unpaid time, like my whole site and business sort of predicate on helping drivers figure out when and where to go to make mm -hmm. the most amount of money. And when you kind of align that with the company's utilization and their incentives, they're not going to let you log on. Like right now, Friday at 2, 3 p.m. in the afternoon when rides are slow out in the middle of nowhere. Like, do you really need to do that as a driver? Like probably 0.01% of drivers actually need that flexibility. So I think to me, that was kind of like the real question is like, how much flexibility are they going to lose? And does it really matter? And I, I don't think we ever really got to the bottom of that because it's just it's so hard to, to say without actually doing it. Right? Yeah, I mean, my I think my dream scenario would have been for them to reclassify back in January when the law went into effect so that we could have a clear comparison or even when the court ordered them to do it a couple months ago, just so that we could actually see, okay, this is what employment would look like in California. Mm -hmm. And this is what, you know, sort of IC status quo would look like in California. Um, Cause that's, I don't know, all of that still seems so vague and unclear to me. And the claims on both sides were so drastically different. I was like this, yeah. no one is being fully honest about <laughs> what's going to happen here or even knows. I don't, I mean, I don't want to say. Yeah. Like, well, I think that's actually honest, like, the big thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think really it's, there's more unknowns than mm. knowns. And so when you kind of have a campaign of hyperbole, like obviously each side is just going to take their you know messaging to the extremes. And yeah, that's yeah. why I figured it, it's probably somewhere in the middle. But I, I think that's like what I ended up telling a lot of people. It seems like there's more unknowns than knowns. Like anyone who says they know what's going to happen is kind of like probably full of it at mm -hmm. this point. Um, but there was a lot of like competing information yeah. and something you said was really interesting. Like, you know, being able to contact all of your users, all of your constituents, all of your voters, like that seems just so powerful for the yes on 22 mm -hmm. side, because like you said, you know, 
they could say, hey, here's more info on Prop 22. Here's the studies that we did. Here's, you know, right. here's the, the kind of cherry picked, you know, surveys like some like mine, which we get into, you know, that we like, <laughs> yeah. you know, that sort of like bolster our narrative um, that we paid for, you know, that we like basically. And then there's no like ability to provide that counter, you know, like how when they pass out the voting booklets, it's like, mm -hmm. here's the pro side and here's the response. Right. The there's nothing on. to like mm -hmm. counter that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's really interesting having that captive audience sort of in this space where you can't be fact checked or pushed back, pushed back on is really powerful. Um, you know, and I mean, I haven't really been doing any rides since the pandemic hit, but you know, I went in and kind of looked at both of the apps to see what they were saying and, and what the messaging was, you know, and some of it, I was like, okay, this is pretty accurate. Some of it, I was like, mm -hmm. Nope, <laughs> that's not true. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think as a voter, how much time are you really going to spend going into every little claim and picking it apart, especially on a ballot as crowded as California's is, you know, but yeah, yeah I mean, having access to that mega list of riders and drivers, I think was so important for the Yes campaign and for a normal campaign to contact voters. I mean, you're spending right. a bunch of money buying voter rolls and, and trying to, you know work with a firm to figure out who to target, where they are, do you have the right phone number? Uber and Lyft yeah. already have all of that. So in a way, they're just just so far ahead of a normal campaign. Yeah. I mean, I want to say I'm like not 100% sure, but I feel like Uber and Lyft both at one time or another sent push notifications to customers mm -hmm. in California, right? And so even if you hadn't been, you know, even if you haven't taken a ride in the past 12 months, right? You, if you have the Uber app on your phone, which I think a lot of people do, um, you know, you would have got that notification and, you know, seen what they had to say. Did you, you know, there were some criticisms of the, the ways that the companies were leveraging and, you know, not, you know, like, for example, like that, the fact that they, you know, it's sort of this weird gray area, I think, because it's like their users, right? So they're sort of allowed to send them emails, right? Mm -hmm. But like in normal advertising, you have to disclose who's paying for it and all that. Did you, do you think their tactics like of leveraging their own user base went too far? Or were there any examples that you thought were, you know, kind of like pushing the limits? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm trying to remember, I think most of the emails and push alerts and stuff that I saw had those little disclosures in them somewhere. Okay. You know, the fine print says paid for by Lyft, DoorDash, et cetera. But they're not really um, paid for if they're using like their own app, right? Well, so kind of. Um, the okay. way that a lot of the stuff that they did in the app was considered as an in-kind donation. Mm. Um, so, you know, not necessarily a cash donation to the campaign, but um, a donation with monetary value. So you see those okay. all reported out of, okay. you know, how much of their staff salary and how much of their resources they kind of try to formulate how much mm. that's worth and then put it in as like part of the donation to the campaign. Um, so all of that stuff is considered, you know, of, of financial value. Mm -hmm. um, Makes sense. And then what was the rest of your question? I just forgot what... Um, oh, I was just sort of saying that did, were there examples of it like kind of going too far? Like one, you know, like I know Instacart, I think they got in some trouble because they were like telling their their workers to like put pamphlets or like, yes, on mm -hmm. 20. It was like one of the items you had to check off. And I was like, whoa, that seems like too far. But, you know, like, you know, the, the, it was really interesting, I think, to like just see all the different tactics just from like a purely like you know, if you objectively look at it, whether, you know, mm -hmm. take your feelings of yes or no out of it and just see how they ran that campaign. I thought that part was interesting. Yeah, I think that is interesting. And there's actually a lawsuit against Uber in particular yeah. over this, um, you know, where they sued on behalf of drivers saying this is politically coercive, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and their argument is actually kind of interesting because I, I, I believe the way that the law works and I'm not a lawyer, so, you know, consult your own legal advice, but Right. Um, you're not supposed to politically coerce your employees, um, but you can mm. politically coerce independent contractors, <laughs> I guess. So what the lawsuit is arguing is that the Uber drivers were employees under the law mm. all summer long since the law went into effect in January. And so, you know, it was illegal to politically coerce them into mm -hmm. trying to support Prop 22 or tell them, you know, in a, in a pop up or whatever, click, yes, I support Prop 22 before you log on to drive. Um, so, so they're kind of testing that in court and we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah it's a good argument i mean i like that argument just because like by the letter of the law like the abc test with Mm -hmm. ab5 they are employees and so it's sort of like even though the company doesn't think of them as employees they kind of are for like this lawsuit so it's a Mm -hmm. creative argument i guess you would say yeah i think it's an interesting and it's a really interesting way to approach it um you mentioned your your surveys earlier though and and so i'd love to hear about how that all happened and because i don't know i think like I got a lot of questions on Twitter when I said I was going to come on the show where people were like, ask him about this unscientific survey. Um, and yeah, so, people people get really mad at my surveys. And, but you, <laughs> so do, it's, you do surveys all the time, well, right? Like are you trying to be scientific yeah, or what is going on with the survey? Yeah, so I, I guess what I would say is like I describe them as unscientific and but we've also been surveying drivers for like close to five years now, mm-hmm. surveyed thousands of drivers, worked with, you know, like, worked with academic researchers from Stanford, people from like nonprofits, like all to basically, you know, like basically for an unscientific poll, it's like about as good as you're going to get. Um, but we're also like surveying our audience. Right. And mm-hmm. so there's of course like potential biases and, you know, like, you know, I think we, in our methodology of like our actual surveys, we detail like, yeah, it's an English written language blog. So a lot, obviously a lot of like uh, immigrant drivers are not going to be, you know, following like English written blog, you know, so stuff mm-hmm. like that. But I think for me, like it was more about like for the past five years oh if you just think about the workforce like 80 you know from Lyft's s1 80 percent of drivers are doing 10 to 20 hours a week or less you know uber is similar numbers that's i think pretty well agreed upon that a majority of drivers are 10 to 20 hours a week or less and so it just kind of makes sense to me that like if they're able to leverage the best aspects of being an independent contractor, you know, the flexibility, being able to kind of work, you know, the best hours or the hours that work the most for their schedule, like it's not like, you know, not like a shocking result to like, 60 to 70 percent of them want to be independent contractors and then mm-hmm. are for prop 22 and that's sort of like what my surveys have found over the years very consistently on like the w2 versus independent contractor debate and then with prop 22 the numbers are right very similar like 66 percent i think of all drivers and 61 or two percent of drivers in california were were uh, for prop 22 and it was six or seven hundred driver samples i mean not the biggest survey ever but i think it's a pretty significant number And so for me, you know, when I saw criticisms or even like this kind of goes back to that competing info Mm -hmm. sort of point that you mentioned, like, I think it's less like about worrying like, okay, yeah, you could complain about who's paying for the surveys or but like, what are the results actually saying? Do they make sense? Like, I don't think it. I, like I, one thing I, I really push back a lot on the no on 22 campaign is I don't think it makes sense to argue that against like most drivers being in for prop 22. I think that's like a foregone conclusion. Mm-hmm. What I think makes more sense is to argue that, hey, on the 10 to 20 percent of drivers who are full time, we actually make up a majority of the total trips on the platform, a majority of the total hours on the platform. And, you know, that doesn't sound as good on a flyer or a mailer, but like, you know, it's like a more nuanced argument, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Did you know that uh, the campaign was going to start using your survey? Did they reach out to you at all before that happened or was that kind of a surprise? Um... They didn't reach out to me, but they've cited, I mean, you know, like uh, Dara has cited like my surveys in the Mm -hmm. past, you know, like on the independent contractor versus employee issue. Um, They've never like given me a heads up. And it's sort of, I I think I mentioned in an article uh, that it's like a little weird being used in like Uber and Lyft's propaganda because I do (laughs) stand behind the survey results, uh, but it's kind of like, I'm not getting paid for it. I'm not, you know, it's sort of like, but at the same time, you know, if they were like, they, they like ran a TV commercial and it was like the results came from the rideshare guy. I'm like, oh, that's good exposure for me personally, obviously, if I'm trying to build a brand and a business. So it's sort of like a weird, you know, like I'm not going to be like, this is, you know, something I don't want, but it's also like, it's just a weird feeling because I kind of like feel it's like a little bit of a good thing, but bad thing, but I'm like helping me personally. But, you know, so it was just sort Mm -hmm. of a weird thing and they kind of stopped using it. So I think that was like the best and they had their own survey. So I think that was kind of like the best result <laughs> Yeah. towards the end. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, going back to what you were saying a minute ago, I think that's right that, you know, the, the overall, the number of drivers, right. There's a huge number of them that mm-hmm. drive a very small amount of hours. And then the ones that are actually kind of like fueling the platform and keeping the bulk of the business afloat are some of those full-time drivers. And I, I think that, I don't know. You're right. It doesn't work on a flyer, (laughs) but I think that that's the right way of looking at it. And I, 
I wish that there had been a little bit more of the conversation focused on that, because I think there's also a split, you know, in the way that drivers view, you know, what they're getting out of the companies. Like I've talked to a lot of full-time drivers who do want those more, you know, strong employment benefits, do want those wages. And a lot of part-time drivers who, yeah, of course, the flexibility is way more important at that point if you're only using the platform a couple hours a week. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, health, healthcare benefits are, uh, and that's the thing, right? Like, I, you know, we have all of this data in our surveys, you know, we mm-hmm. look at like full time versus part time and healthcare, but I think like with a lot, and that's why I find it so funny that like everyone is gets so caught up on polling and surveys. And I think as we've seen like polling and surveys and all that, like you got to take all of this with a grain of salt and just mm-hmm. think about it a little more logically. Like, okay, if you're a part time driver, like probably have health care from somewhere else, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, if you have it even in the first place, right. right, you probably have other sources of income or you have other people, you know, in your family there because you can't live off of two, three hundred dollars a week from Uber and Lyft versus someone who's, you know, working 50 hours a week and making a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a week. And so that was sort of, you know, I, I guess, it, again, it is tough to like get into some of those nuanced debates, but I guess that would be the other challenge that from the get-go i thought uber and lyft had like really easy messaging because like you know in political Mm -hmm. campaigns like everything everyone says there's like a kernel of truth in it usually um and you know like their kernel of truth is that like drivers love the flexibility and of course you can like peel back that onion in a bunch of different ways Mm -hmm. but like the no one twin i just didn't feel like they had access to as compelling a messaging did you see anything on the no side that was like you know I mean, like, let's look at the Bay Area, for example, like they Mm -hmm. voted overwhelmingly, you know, the other way and were really kind of like the only county. So something must have worked there, right? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, there's something to that of like, I think people who follow the industry very closely and know the business really well, understand a little bit more about how drivers are exploited in that system. Whereas people who you know, aren't immersed in tech news 24 seven, maybe aren't as tapped into that side of what's going on with the platforms. Um, and I think I finally threw away all my flyers the other day because I was making a huge mess in my house. With them. <laughs> and you probably like wanted to stop thinking about it. But then yeah. I emailed you and I was like, come on my podcast and you never have to talk Prop 22 again. <laughs> oh, no, I have to talk Prop 22 for the rest of my life, Harry. <laughs> yeah, you're stuck. I mean, we're going national with this now. So I feel like this is, story is just going to go on and on forever. Um, but I think the one no flyer that I got, the messaging was something like, um, you know, I think it was kind of going for a corporate greed angle. Yeah. It had like a guy exploiting a us. Yeah. It was like, you know, don't trust these tech companies, something along that kind of, that kind of line. Yeah. Um, and I think, I don't know. I mean, doing a proposition around an employment issue is really hard because I said this the other day when uh, Mike and I were doing our live stream about Prop 22, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, most employment law isn't based off of necessarily what each individual employee wants, right? Mm-hmm. Like, because you end up with people who will go into a race to the bottom just because they're trying to survive, yeah. they're trying to hustle, they're trying to get their check. Um, you know, and, and so if you think about like child labor law, right, we say, okay, you have to be 16 to work. And, you know, when I was 15, if someone, I mean, I did work, I had it under the table. I, I, I worked you know? when I was 14 too. So I think yeah, I, I, I pickles in bingo hall at one point, like I did all kinds of crazy <laughs> under the table jobs. Um, but, you know, the, the law is intended to sort of set a baseline to protect right. the group rather than, okay, me as an individual, I want to do this. So I'm going to do it just mm-hmm. because I need to get cash in my pocket. Um, you're sort of trying to set a baseline of what's acceptable, right? And so I think this is really interesting because it says, well, this isn't what the drivers want. This isn't what the mm-hmm. drivers want. And that's very compelling, but it's also just like not in step with the way employment law works in this country yeah. at all. You know, it's not necessarily about what the employee wants. It's about protecting yeah. like the group of employees. Right. Um, and like, I mean, the child labor law is perfect, right? Like someone who's 12 years old and, you know, like if their family can't work and they're the only one in their family that can work, like they really want to work, oh, but right. there's just this huge potential for abuse or, exactly. you know, sort of like mismanagement or whatever it might be. And so that, eh, that's, that's a good point. I've never thought about it. And I know that, um, my, uh, my, my buddy on Twitter, uh, Will Coleman from Alto is, a, is another ride sharing company. He brings this point up to me a lot because they have employee drivers right. and he's constantly bringing up that, you know, it's great. Like drivers want this, but 
that shouldn't really matter sometimes in the eyes of em employment. Well, I mean, I guess I guess it should and it shouldn't. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't know. How do you how do you think about that question about like what drivers want and balancing that? Because you know, another thing. I wanted to ask you about is this the seven eighths proposition, and it kind of made you know that the part that says it needs a seven eighths majority to overturn or amend Prop Twenty Two, and it kind of made me think like, are legislators really doing a good job representing their constituents? If you know they went, they were you know elected by their constituents, right? They go in, they pass AB five, but then this proposition comes onto the ballot and like wins overwhelmingly, right? Obviously, there was a lot of the money spent, so that might have had some influence, but um, you know. I'm I'm just curious about that. Sorry, I'm throwing a lot out there for yeah. you, but I mean, I think the question about what drivers want, um, there is a problem there. I think in the way that you know, legislators, regulators, state officials have approached this issue, because you know, when Uber and Lyft were starting out, it's not like employment wasn't an issue. Employment was right. an issue from day one. <laughs> Yeah, um, and five, six so, years ago. <laughs> right. And, and there was an opportunity right then and there for regulators to say, hey, these people are employees and you need to employ them. And mm -hmm. then I don't think we would have ended up in this situation, right, where now you have hundreds of thousands of people driving right. in a state and they're like, well, I like it. I'm attached to it. I'm counting on this money. You can't take yeah. it away from me. Like if you enforce the standard from day one, you don't end up with this issue where people are then wanting to deviate from the standard or have latched onto things that, you know, yeah. are not legal in the eyes of the state, but are very attractive to them. You know, there was sort of this opportunity, I think, for regulators to say, no, this isn't going to work. These are employees and you need to treat them as employees and for the business to grow with that expectation. Right. Um, that that's, didn't happen. That, obviously. Yeah, no, that's actually a really good point. And I've brought it up a couple of times because I've been doing my, my blog and podcast and YouTube channel for six years now. And so I specifically remember, you know, literally in that first year, right. And actually the last election cycle, like the employee versus independent contractor stuff was an issue and people were talking about it and then it kind of went away. And so I think it's easy to say like, oh, you know, Uber and Lyft, right. Like have, you know, grown this huge business and now it's hard to, you know, I think it is legitimate you know, like criticism, but it's hard to tell them like, Hey, you guys are, you know, multi-billion dollar companies completely change everything now because like we didn't really do our job four five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, I guess you don't want to let the companies completely off the hook, but you also don't want to let regulators completely off the hook too. Right. And I think, you know, the other part of your question is, okay, if, if there's clearly support for the, the independent contractor plus model that Uber and Lyft mm -hmm. are pushing for, why are regulators working or legislators working against that? And I think yeah. you get into this thing of sort of competing constituencies, right? Like, yeah. you know, maybe drivers want this, but small businesses that are paying into the unemployment insurance fund certainly don't. You know, they want to yeah. see giant companies like Uber contribute. Um, and those people are represented by those officials as well. So you get into some of these competing priorities of, you know, it's not just sort of a pure, okay, let's tally up okay, there's this many drivers and there's this many small businesses and whoever has the most people on their side wins. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, before we move on to sort of what what's next, you, you mm -hmm. uh, foreshadowed earlier sort of the, the states that you might be covering this Prop 22 for a while. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any <laughs> quick quick thoughts on the, the just generally the 7-8 proposition or part of the proposition that sort of requires a, I guess, what, what, what are the logistics? It just requires a seven eighths majority in order to amend or yes. repeal. Yeah. It requires a seven eighths majority in the state legislature to make changes, um, which, you know, is a very high majority. Right. Um, even though I think I heard someone describe it as like happy mother's day. It's like, that's the only thing, you know, that might get a seven eighths majority <laughs> is right. Like happy mother's day. <laughs> yeah. I would have to go back and do the math on, what um what the total was that voted to mm -hmm. pass ab5 because there was the number of people who voted up to oppose it was pretty low if i recall mm -hmm. but i still mm -hmm. don't think it would have met the seven eights um so yeah i mean it's it's made it virtually impossible to change which you know there's something kind of fundamentally gross about that i think for yeah. a company to come in sponsor its own law that's favorable to what the company wants to do and to add this restriction into it of like no one can yeah. come back and change this and try to, you know, clean it up. Yeah. It seemed like to me is, and yeah, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not a, 
political <laughs> campaign strategist, but like that was the thing. Like, like I, I cared less about like the, what the actual like Prop Twenty Two was saying. It was like, look, this company is spending two hundred million dollars on something. Like that can't be good. You know what I mean? Like it just <laughs> seemed like the worst financial products have like the best salesman is sort of a saying, right? If it's like they're spending that much money, like obviously it's not good because you know they wouldn't need to spend that much if it was better. Um, if they you know are doing the seven eighths majority, it's because you know it's like they really don't want this to be changed. I think the counter argument I heard there from the companies and others is that, you know, if they are spending 200 million, they don't want a simple majority can just overturn it. And then we're like kind of at square one. So I, I guess that's sort of their argument there. Interesting. Okay. But uh, yeah, so, you know, you, you mentioned the the states that, and cities are next. Um, you your last your one of your latest articles. I think it's funny. I, I read it just yesterday, but you've had three or four articles since then somehow, and uh, <laughs> on different topic. The election has been really big. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you yeah. mentioned New York, Illinois, and Massachusetts, I believe. So I'm just curious, like if we're looking out onto, you know, more of a national scope, um, like why, why did Prop 22 matter so much? Is it because other states are basically looking at doing similar things? Yeah, um, there was a lot of talk sort of around the time when AB5 was in process of other states thinking about doing a similar kind of law and sort of waiting to see how it was going to play out in California. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are also states that have a similar law already on the books. Like you mentioned Massachusetts, they right. also have an ABC test for employment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the state attorney general out there is also suing Uber and Lyft, trying to get them to reclassify. So they're looking at, you know, California part two out there with mm -hmm. the same legal fight that they've just gone through here. And so I think from the company's perspective, they don't want to keep doing this over and over right. again. Spending 200 millions on a proposition. Right. I mean, what's 200 million times 50 states, right? Like that's right. just not a good look um, for for them financially. So um, I think there is a lot of appetite for the companies to try to figure this out at the federal level. Mm. Um, I know there's been some sort of testing the waters in D.C. trying to figure out if they could get some support on the Hill to do some kind of federal legislation around this. Um mm -hmm. You know, and they're also, I think, looking at the incoming administration, right? Both Biden and Harris said during the campaign that they opposed Prop 22 uh, right. and that they would try to strengthen employment protection. So, you know, we're, they're kind of looking at that as well and, and wondering, OK, what's going to happen to us under the incoming administration? Yeah. And I mean, typically, you know, these companies have sort of looked to get kind of TNC friendly regulation passed at a local level. And if that doesn't work, they go to the state level and just sort of go higher and higher. And I think in this case, it's kind of interesting because as you mentioned, right, I think actually all of the Democratic primary candidates like came out in support of AB5, mm -hmm. um, you know, tweeted their support or shared it. And then uh, Kamala Harris and uh, Joe, Joe, President-elect Joe Biden also have been pretty, you know, outspoken. I think you would say like, it's not just a tweet here and there. I feel like they've mentioned it on multiple mm -hmm. times, you know, their support for Pro Act or AB5 right. or, you know, basically anti Uber and Lyft and other companies. Um, so do you think the, you know, and but the companies obviously would rather do it at the federal level because much mm -hmm. cheaper than doing it state by state. What, what, what do you think is that going to be the company's approach? Is it state by state or a little of both? It sounds like so far they're definitely looking at the federal level. Um, I mm -hmm. don't think they're interested in having the battle state by state. Um, yeah. But you know, it's it's sort of a guessing game right now about how they get that done. Um, yeah. Getting any legislation passed federally right now is not an <laughs> easy thing to do. Um, you know, and it's also not clear where their support is going to come from. I think Ted Cruz said something supportive about Prop 22, but he's one of the only people that's spoken publicly mm. in support of it. And so, you know, I think Again, it, it's sort of a balancing act for Uber and Lyft, right, to try to, you know, maybe build some coalition on the mm -hmm. Republican side of the House and the Republican side of the Senate, you know, at the same time, not trying to cross the new administration, not trying to like right. become <laughs> sort of a top Target enforcement for priority, right, for yeah. the Biden administration. So, so it's tricky for them. I think they're going all in on the federal path, but so far I don't see the clear path of how that's actually going to work. And I don't know, I, I've heard a lot of very um, optimistic talk from the mm -hmm. companies about a federal <laughs> solution. And I just, 
I don't know if that's in step really with the way that DC works. Yeah, I, I think I do agree with you is that that's probably their desired path, but I don't see a clear path to getting that done. And it kind of makes me think of the fact that, you know, we're here in California and Prop 22 passed, I think what you would call, what I would call overwhelmingly or, you know, with a, with a large majority. And it's kind of the bluest of blue states, right? I mean, when mm -hmm. you look at like their numbers for President, you know, elect Biden um, and, but yet it's sort of, so it kind of makes me think like, okay, in every other state, especially, you know, red redder states, right? Like if it, if Prop 22 passed overwhelmingly here in the bluest of blue, it seems like it has really good chances for like similar legislation in all of these, you know, other states, especially, you know, as they get more red. Um, so it seems like they kind of have a path there. It just might take a while, might cost them mm -hmm. money. So my question is like, what, what, what does this mean for labor? Like, it seems like, they kind of lost this battle in California or what, oh, what, what have you found there? Oh, I have a lot of thoughts about this, but I have to, <laughs> let me think about how to talk about them. Um, well, I, I can, I can, I can warm you up. I can get you started. <laughs> I think that like to me, and this has been one area where I actually have really appreciated your reporting and also your colleague, uh, Noam Schreiber, because I think you guys have both highlighted like some of the kind of backroom negotiations and deals and all this stuff that's happening that like, I have no idea about, but it's really interesting. And it seems to me like labor had the opportunity to compromise kind of leading up to AB5. They took a big swing for the fences and they wanted everyone to be classified as employees prop 22 came around and now they sort of have egg on their face and kind of looks to me like they lost so it seems like they took a swing for the fence and lost and going forward they're not going to have as much negotiating power so uh, am i right wrong or oh, way no. off all, all could be possible so the organizing aspect of this is interesting um normally the way things work right is that unions are allowed to represent employees mm -hmm. so when you have this giant independent contractor class, no one is really set up to represent them or to bargain for them. And so I think a lot of unions are looking at gig workers as potential members, yeah. right? Like if they could bring them into the employee classification, they could also bring them into the union. Um, but right now they're just kind of floating out yeah. there. And there's some groups that have tried to do kind of casual organizing with them. Um, like Rideshare Drivers United down in LA, mm -hmm. Gig Workers Rising gets a little bit bigger up here in the Bay Area. Um, you know, but they're sort of informal organizing groups. And so part of the weird thing about the way that labor and the companies are negotiating with each other is that none of them really represents drivers today. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not really anyone's fault because under the law, they can't represent them. But it's a lot of people sort of trying to say what's best for the drivers or say, you know, this is what drivers want without really representing the drivers, yeah. right? Like the companies there are there to represent their own financial interests. The unions are there to try to grow their membership and bring those people in, yeah. but none of them represent drivers currently. And so a lot of the backroom negotiating that's going on seems like sometimes it misses the driver perspective mm -hmm. a little bit, um, would benefit from that. I think um, it will be interesting to see going forward how labor tries to come together on this um, and how they try to negotiate around what should happen at the national level. It's possible that you see some people in labor more willing to make a deal after they've seen the outcome of Prop 22. And I think you've kind of seen some hints at that from labor leaders in the past couple of weeks where they've been saying, okay, we'll sit down. Mm -hmm. We'll hear, we'll hear this out. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky, right? Because, you know, they also still, I think, have a lot of, um, a lot of duty to represent the employees who are already part of their unions, mm -hmm. right? Who a lot of those people are relying on them to advocate for pay beyond a minimum wage, yeah. advocating for them you know, to provide benefits that are sort of beyond the bare minimum. And so if those unions are willing to sit down with Uber and Lyft and cut different deals where it's like, okay, you can earn less than minimum wage, it's like... Mm. Yeah, it puts them in know, a tough spot, right? Because it's not really and, their and business. <laughs> and some 
the unions, right, you know, they're representing other drivers as well, wow. drivers that work for FedEx or UPS or, you know, these other services. And I think if they sit down and cut a deal with Uber, they kind of run the risk of having Amazon or whoever yeah. knock on their door and be like, hey, you saw what you did over there. Mm. We would also like to pay our employees less money. Interesting. <laughs> Where are we going to go from here? Um, yeah. So it's 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 risky. Okay. That, that's a good point. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, it, it sort of seems like, you know, if the labor the labor unions are kind of kind of stuck in a in a pretty tough spot right because if they do you know they really don't i mean i guess it's like for the ones who are sort of more forward thinking or you know kind of like embracing this new model it's like okay we can kind of disrupt ourselves but then i'm sure there's other organizations where they start affecting their current members or other industries and yeah i, I think that's a mm-hmm. foregone conclusion that other companies you know like amazon or whoever would come and try to renegotiate uh, you know similar deals to what uber and lyft are going to get um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> right. Well, there's also the, the aspect, right. Of, you know, I, I work in a unionized industry mm-hmm. and, and we chose the union that we were going to organize yeah. with. Um, and I think when you do have a class of workers who are working for multiple platforms, that gets a little confusing, right? Like if the Lyft drivers decide they want to organize under the Teamsters mm-hmm. and the Uber drivers decide they want to organize with SEIU, what do you do with the drivers that drive for both platforms? Yeah. Like which union are they yeah. in? <laughs> um, it just becomes really complicated. So there's a lot of questions about how you could organize this sort of gig workforce and, and what good representation would look like. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to think about that one because it's a topic I don't know a whole lot about. And we might have to have you on again in the future to do a whole episode on uh, labor since uh, I'm sure you've got some thoughts. That. So really appreciate you coming well, on wedding. today, Kate. <laughs> and if people want to follow more of your work or read your stuff, where should they go? Uh, New York Times. We always welcome a subscriber. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. My handle is just at Kate Conger. Great. Cool. Well, appreciate it, Kate, and uh, take care.